Are you ready to explore how people coordinate to build and empower your community to take action and solve problems to coordinate without any central authority? What? Bring in the OGs of the pre-crypto decentralized coordination space together with the pioneers of the cutting edge technologies to fuse their ancient knowledge with the latest tools in order to fight coordination failures, slay Moloch and continue the endless search for the holy grails of decentralized coordination. Welcome to the front lines of coordination. Fuck. My brain is already melting. I hope you survive. Welcome, Aaron. How are you doing, man? Thank you. Uh, I'm good. It's good to be here. It's a sunny day out here in California. So Nice. 8 p.m. here in Croatia, but not too late for this conversation. <laughs> it's never, uh, never too late to talk about decentralized governance. It's always the right time. <laughs> yeah, man. That's why I invited you here. I know you like talking about decentralized governance and governance in general. And we have this podcast about decentralized coordination. So I thought, yeah, it would be perfect fit. So you want to say a bit more about yourself for the people who don't know you? Yeah, totally. So I am Aaron Soskin. It's nice to, nice to meet everyone out there. Um, I'm the founder of a project called Govern. And at Govern, what we're doing is, is we're kind of building tools for our coordination tools or DAO governance tools, specifically for constituents or contributors. We kind of think that anything that governs you, you should be able to govern back. And while there's a lot of like tools out there to like govern down, we think there's less to govern up. Um, and that's kind of what we're focusing on. So yeah, I'm the founder of a project called Govern. I've been in the like governance, Ethereum, blockchain, crypto space for four years-ish, four or five years. I really left once I like learned about DAOs and I learned about smart contracts and uh, the kind of implications that'll have on communities. I left my old job and like dove head first in. I like you know became obsessed with it. So um, been here ever since. Ooh, and it's a new slogan. I know uh, what was it you said before that uh, we should be able to govern the things that uh, govern us. Yeah, that that is the new slogan. It's anything that governs you, you should be able to govern. That's what like accountability is, if you think about it, right? Like Spencer, if you're familiar with Spencer, he just published this this piece literally like just a couple of minutes ago. Spencer Graham just pu- published this piece a couple hours ago about anti-capture or decentralization. And he offers this really interesting definition of decentralization I really liked, which is like decentralization isn't so much the number of people you have uh, in a network, but rather it's like ability to be resistant um, by capture of bad actors. And I kind of really like that frame of reference because that's what self-governance is. Like self-governance doesn't necessarily mean everyone is voting on every single thing. Self-governance means that no one person can take over the system because we govern ourselves, right? It's community governance. So yeah, like we like the slogan that anything that governs you, you should be able to govern. Like leaders are not a problem if you cannot also govern those leaders. So. Yeah, that's the yeah, that's the new slogan we're kind of focused on. Yeah, I love it. There's this sort of notion that uh, there should be no leaders in DAOs, which I think is kind of not how real life works. Got any thoughts on that? It, yeah, I mean, I don't even think it's just limited to DAOs, right? Leaders are in all organizations, whether or, or communities, whether we'd like to admit it or not. I actually think it's a problem when we lie to ourselves and say that we don't have leaders because really we've now created like dictators, right? Or like informalized politicians that have no checks and balances. Like there are leaders and organizations. We should recognize that um, and just put in proper processes into place. Right. The tyranny of structurelessness. The old say that just keeps on coming back up. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. So what was your like, previous occupation or what you did before getting into this stuff? Oh, the previous work uh, before I was in the crypto space? Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah, yeah. So before I was in the crypto space, I did management consulting. 
for a large like management consulting firm. And it was really interesting. I did a lot of work on incentive alignment between like suppliers and their distributors and resellers, which required us to like understand organizational behavior and incentive structures and incentive strategies. And it spent a lot of time learning in like a top down supply chain model or sales channel model, how you can build incentive strategies to make everybody down the chain act appropriately. So that's what I was doing before, but like why I loved DAOs so much, or like not just DAOs, but like blockchain so much and Web3, is that these incentive strategies are incredibly effective. I mean, that's why so many top-down type chains use them. But what's really fascinating about this new crypto Web3 world is that it's not a top-down incentive strategy. Like we as a group of people create our own incentive structures and mutually agree to them. We as people who are all on the same level mutually agree on the type of work that we'll be incentivizing together. I mean, I thought that was a really, really powerful, powerful tool or powerful idea. Right. And then you kind of just jumped over. <laughs> and then I kind of just jumped over. <laughs> I, uh, I, <laughs> so I was, I was like, doing management. This is cool, but this is cooler. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, so I was doing management consulting and it was really kind of interesting I worked in the financial services practice and they were starting to do more work in like with blockchain, like companies or blockchain projects. And they said, okay, everyone's got to go learn about this blockchain stuff now. And it was really funny. The first project I actually had to go learn about was the first thing was obviously Bitcoin, but then they asked us to go learn a lot about Ripple because that was a project we were looking into. Learned about Ripple. I then learned about Ethereum. And once I got to the Ethereum side i then learned about DAOs. i learned about smart contracts and what my like passion is where a lot of this drives from is political governance and social causes and civic engagement like building better and more equitable politics and more equitable civic engagement and social structures that's actually been my passion that's where i like lived and worked for that's where i like studied in school that's what i like spent my time volunteering with and I learned about smart contracts. I learned about how smart contracts made future commitments accountable to present day commitments accountable in future time. Um, that's what a smart contract does. I learned about DAOs and how it can create these abilities of self-governing organizations. And I immediately, for me, day one, the immediate use case has always been, how can we apply these principles to our civic societies or civic structures? How do we apply these to our political structures, which will forever be around? to create more equitable systems. And that, that use case was just so clear to me once I learned about it. And once that use case popped up and once I saw how it could be applicable, I literally just could not stop thinking about it. Like anytime <laughs> I saw a problem in politics, anytime I saw a problem in the world around me, it just became clear that if we could govern ourselves a little bit more, we might not fix this problem, but we could at least make it a little bit better is what drove me. And so, yeah, I saw that. I saw the writing on the wall and I was like, I need to be working on this. This is the, like, this is the thing that matters right now. And yeah, so I quit my old job and, and took the leap. Right. It's funny how the company set you on this path. They were like, uh, hey, go learn this. And then you were like, uh, goodbye. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's like, thank you for the interest. Goodbye. And it's actually funnier than that. I actually only ended up learning about this. I was like at the office one day and every now and then the practice, the subdivision I worked in would to get people to research these new topics, they would put on these free lunches. I like, was it just in the office? And they're like, all right, our brown bag, they called it our brown bag lunch and learn, which is like they serve you a free lunch and they teach you about a topic is on blockchain today. And I was like, well, I didn't bring lunch from home. Like this is a great opportunity to go get a free lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea what blockchain was and I sat down and I they just started talking and I was like whoa this is the craziest and coolest thing I've ever heard and so yeah it's it's funny how life works out like that <laughs> yeah. does it kind of then uh, tie with the things that you were doing outside of work yeah so like growing up I was always really interested in politics I just found that politics is this, such an interesting and fascinating thing that we as people like created over time to say, hey, like for people to live life and for things to get done, we're going to create this other structure called politics. 
that we all engage with and have some kind of social contract to. And that's going to like govern so much of our lives. And that like the systems that we are like this contract that we've signed up for or haven't signed up for in some case can have such both positive and negative implications on people's lives. And so I've always just was fascinated about that. I like worked in a couple interned in different like political organizations. I did a lot of organizing and civic engagement when I was younger and in college just because I found that to be like one of the most powerful things we have as people. And so that was the work I was doing before. And then when I had graduated college, I was convinced to go get a normal job. And then as I did that normal job for a while, I realized I'm like thankful for my time there. I learned so much. I had a really good experience, but that was just like learnings for this, you know, bigger future I wanted to get back to. Makes sense. And then what was the path like from getting into crypto to studying govern? Yeah. So basically I learned about crypto. I learned about blockchain and, and DAOs and I started researching them. And to me, I wanted to, immediately what we did is I was like, okay, if we can smart start with the smart contract, if we, what we can align for is better incentive alignment. How do we turn politics from a zero sum game, which is, is right now to a positive sum game, even back then. We had a very adversarial relationship with our politicians where we feel like we're having to like fight against them at all points in time. How can we realign the incentives beyond the same team, number one? But two, to me, if you think about like what DeFi does, it replaces big banks, right? Um, these big centralized money institutions. Specifically in US politics, there are these other really big giant money institutions called lobbyists or PACs or political parties. And all they do is they're giant piggy banks essentially and i was like okay it's going to be hard to get rid of these giant piggy banks what if we just replace these giant piggy banks with more equitable and decentralized structures and so we came up with the idea we came up with a couple ideas of how to apply open source methodologies decentralization and DAOs to politics and we started like i started govern so that happened very quickly i worked on that for a couple months while my old job and then I left my old job to start Govern, which was the idea of how do we apply DAOs to politics? How do we make a lobbyist organization or a political party actually run as a DAO? Um, and that's what that's what we started with. That that was the beginning of the journey. Mm -hmm. And when was that? That was two or three years ago at this point. We started with this idea of these things called outcome-based donations. The idea of an outcome-based donation was that you could donate money to a politician but the politician only received your donation of a metric or an outcome that you or your community cared about. So like, for example, I really cared about fixing education in, in my local city. So I could donate a hundred dollars to the mayor of whatever city on the condition that high school graduation rates go up by 2% in the next four years. And what we were really doing is we were actually forming DAOs. We formed DAOs around these outcomes or interest groups, like fixing education. And then the DAO would come up with a proposal and metric to incentivize and essentially form a bounty for the politician to then go and accomplish. That was the original idea. And that's what we worked on and started about two years, three years ago. And we worked on that for a while. But what we realized, like, and everyone really liked it. People were really psyched. Politicians were really excited about the idea of being able to raise money directly from constituents. Constituents were really excited about the idea of being able to influence policy legislation. And we built this whole suite of different DAO tools. But basically a year ago, we just kind of realized that politics is wants DAOs and they're almost there, but they're not quite ready for it. And DAO tooling is also just not quite ready for politics, for these huge civic structures. When you launch DAOs or DAO tooling or these new decentralized governance mechanisms in like a city context, in like a real world context, ramifications if we get it wrong are really really big like it's really huge risks and because of that like the tools just weren't ready for that so we took the same tools that we had been building and we're now just like launching them for much more native DAOs, people that understand it that understand the risks that are already of the same mindset and methodology and people seem to really like those tools we built cool and uh, how do you actually use this stuff so it's pretty interesting what we've kind of found And this was like, again, through our, like our work previously is that like organizations in general are really good at managing, like a lot of DAOs and DAO tools out there. One are kind of designed for community managers, but two are really good at doing like money management. 
right? They're really good at issuing shares based off the money you are contributing, but it's not really good at issuing like Dow shares or voting based off of the like work you do. And so that's kind of the first thing we aim to do is do this thing like called a movement model, which essentially allows you to quantify the work that you are doing and is like trying to create a new primitive based off the like work contributions you make to an organization. If you think of like a primitive, like a POAP, money is a primitive, POAP in my opinion is another primitive. And what I mean by that is like when you get a POAP for something, it's the, the fact that you have the POAP means you attended the event, right? You don't actually have to go to the event and see who like is on the invite or attendee list, right? It's decentralized. You have a POAP that shows that you own it. We want to create that same kind of primitive, but for like a work structure, right? To show that like, okay, I have done this one unit of work. This is the primitive that shows that I did this unit of work. And then you can also issue rewards for that primitive for that work on top of it. So you do a thing, you get an on-chain uh, primitive that says you did the thing, and then communities can actually reward you for that work that you've done with shares, with tokens, with money, whatever it is. And the reason why that's like such a game changing idea, if you think back to that idea of whatever governs you, you should be able to govern. This is the check and balance that we have. If you don't have a representation of the work that you do for an organization, that work becomes non-rage quittable. Like that work becomes not yours to own, right? The network and momentum and contributions you have done are inherently locked up in that community. When you create an on-chain record that shows the work that you have done, that you actually own, like that means if you are in a DAO or an organization where like, let's say that there's a tyrannical leader and you're like, you know what? I'm done with this organization. You can actually rage quit that organization or DAO, fork the entire DAO, and then use the work representations, those, those on-chain primitives that you've already done to spin up a new DAO with new governance structures that takes into account the work you had previously done, right? So it essentially gives you ownership over the work that you are actually doing. And we found that to be an incredibly, incredibly powerful tool in the accountability that we can create over like organizations with leaders. All right. And uh, what uh, stage then? You build the first version of it? Yeah. So we've, we've built the first version. It's, it's like obviously still iterating. We're still improving it and making it better. Essentially what the first step is, is communities have to define the types of contributions that they find important or they find valuable. And so you, you do this by forking our repo and setting up your own version of what we call the activity types file. Once you do that and you make a PR to our like GitHub repo saying you're an active DAO, all you have to do is load our bot called Kevin Malone into your dis Discord and you're ready to start using it. So we, we, we make it really easy. <laughs> Why is your bot called uh, Kevin Malone? <laughs> <laughs> the right questions. This is the right question you should be asking. I'm very happy you're asking this question, Keith. There's this TV, uh, TV show in America called The Office. Have you heard of it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, I think The Office is a hilarious TV show. But what's really cool, and this is like, so, so like, I started by like, like our helpline at Govern, like our help email is called Jim Helpert, right? Which is a play on the name Jim Helpert, which was another character in The Office. And I started that just because I thought it was funny. And then Kevin Malone is the accountant on the show. And so because the bot is helping you do accounting of the contributions you're making, we named the bot Kevin Malone. But I think that there's like some actually interesting, like beautiful metaphor that's been created here. Because on the show, The Office, which I am like actually obsessed with, Like the whole concept of the show is this group of 20 workers that work in an office together that all kind of like don't like their job so much or they have a lot of problems with their job, but they end up staying and they end up ha like building this really beautiful family because of the people and the culture and the structures that they create. And it basically says like even in this like maybe middle like paper company's office in the like very small town in, um, in the United States. You can create family and you can create really impactful like moments um, just by human connection. And I think there's a lot of interesting parallels between that and DAOs. The idea that like these localized communities, like the more connections you can create between people, the like ability to just figure it out as an organization and community kind of lead individual people to prosper. I just thought, thought to be a very beautiful parallel. So now all of the different like bots we create are all going to be characters from the office. So. <laughs> I love it. And then uh, how does the bot itself actually work 
is there like a channel for it or yep exactly there's a channel for the bot you run when you first join a we're like also tra- helping fix like onboarding so the bot actually we allow communities to set up their own onboarding pieces so when you join a new dao or you join a discord uh server you'll run like this called the join command and the bot like kind of lets you report your different ids helps you take you through onboarding steps like what is the first contribution you should do which mm-hmm. is like you go to the intro channel what is the second contribution you should do and you do this thing right you make a pr or whatever so it takes you through the onboarding flow and immediately helps you contribute to the organization and then you run the report command which essentially allows you to report your contributions to the bot which then records it and creates that record of the work that you have done now so it's really really simple cool and you talk to the bot in dm so is there like a channel where you write reports so right now you you write report in a channel and it's going to send you a link to a website where you can actually report it on the website but we're actually making some updates to the bot right now where you don't have to leave discord if you want which i'm pretty excited about very cool and so like when you fork the repo do you get the, the website where all this goes or does it go to the main website or you know, how does it work yeah it, it, when you fork the repo and you launch kevin malone for your organization we create another like a specific website that has a reporting form on it yeah right i like this whole idea of having clear metrics and goals and it's why yeah a few months ago yeller sent me govern and said you should use this for meta game <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, i'd love to hear more yeah so it's actually cool so we actually have two like in the quote-unquote govern platform we have like these two modules right um for us the one is it's called the movement model it's kind of what i just walked through and the one, other one is called outcome coalitions right which is essentially like a non-voting way of exhibiting governance from the bottom up um the outcome coalitions are much more similar to the OKI out the metrics that we were talking about. So the movement model is an important place to start with because it actually allows you to earn like compensation and governance power via normal interactions. I actually think meta game does this pretty well, but a lot of DAOs aren't really good at making it easy for people to earn like sweat equity shares in an organization. You have to buy your way in and that's like a huge problem and barrier for a lot of people. But at govern we kind of believe that all types of contribution is a form of governance right if you think about governance like we usually just think about governance in the terms of voting and like we have honestly done ourselves the biggest disservice in the, in the world in my opinion if you think about what voting is voting is is just you expressing an opinion towards a preference like some kind of cost towards a preference right that happens every day in the actions we take are you taking notes for an organization are you tweeting about an organization are you showing up at meetings are you leading podcasts all these different things are you exhibiting an opportunity cost towards a preference aka a dao or a community or initiative that you believe in all these things are a form of governance and we should capture and reward them and that's how people can actually earn their way into things right like if you think about meta game meta game when i like go through the the game every action i take is creating value from the community like me playing the game creates value for meta game that is good that is a form of governance and should be rewarded so the movement model is a way for people to be rewarded we essentially track that governance and we immediately reward you it's like a continuous retroactive airdrop on a weekly basis with more governance power right so that's the first module like how do you earn governance then what we wanted to do is build a second module these things called outcome coalitions which helps you use the governance in a non-voting way okay and it's basically built around the earlier versions of outcome based donations and so outcome coalitions you can think of as sub dows to accomplish specific initiatives or goals one of the things we realized when we looked at a lot of dows or initiatives is that there's kind of a big problem is that a lot of the times there would be people that wanted to build something but no one that wanted to fund it this happens to me in a lot of dows it's a lot of people want to fund something but nobody is willing to build it like we all want this initiative to happen but no one's actually <laughs> willing to go out there and like build the thing right which is like the funniest thing in the world right so what ends up happening when <laughs> and i actually think that causes way more problems when people want to fund something but there's no one to build it because what happens people put funding behind this initiative we have a bunch of status meetings and every week we have a status meeting or like a catch up 
with no progress being done on this effing initiative. It's so frustrating, right? It's like, okay, one more week, no one's done anything. Like, it's so annoying. Um, <laughs> so, right. <laughs> what we say is that initiatives need to have a double opt-in, like, methodology, which is that you need funders willing to fund an initiative, and you need builders willing to build the initiative. And so the way that outcome coalitions work is that anyone can propose a new initiative or a new idea. Like, let's say you want to do X. Okay, people want to do X, and we essentially form a sub-DAO around doing X. Funders, what they can do is they can go in and submit different proposals that have different metrics to be reached. They say, okay, we would consider doing X being accomplished if, let, let me give a real example. Let's say the doing X is to create educational content to onboard Web3 devs. Like that is what they want. And people can fund different proposals on how to accomplish that. They can say, we would consider this thing done if we are able to create a repo with 10 different artifacts on how to do it, get 10 developers to actually go through the process and have five new PR commits to our local repo, okay? Maybe those are the three milestones. People can essentially fund those different milestones like with the money, that, with the governance they have earned via the movement model, they can fund those different proposals. And then builders, if they want to take those on, can essentially stake their governance on the outcome saying, yep, we are willing to work on this outcome. And once you have an opt-in from the builders and the funders, then that money essentially moves into escrow. And once the builders complete those milestones, that money is unlocked and then sent to the builders, right? So we've now created a way to move up or to surface new initiatives and um, in a kind of an autonomous way, have those initiatives run and builders get paid all without actually having a single vote. It's all done via staking. And we think that's a really, really powerful way right. for new ideas to scale up or scale down. Instead of trying to put something up for a vote, have like long and ongoing discussions about this vote. Now it's just, let's do X. If you want to see X done, put your money behind a milestone that you think would accomplish X. And if builders think that that's the right milestone, they can opt into, into it. Um, so it's a much more iterative and like liquid way of like accomplishing different goals. Yeah, like so many DAOs resort to voting on everything. They see governance equals voting, and then and then we just vote on things. But it doesn't mean that things will happen. Like, yeah, we all agree that this thing should get built. Uh, and then what? The amount of things in DAOs that we vote on something, and then like the money moves and just nothing happens with. It's like mind boggling. It makes zero sense. And it's so infuriating. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, and I get why DAOs operate this way, but a lot of the DAOs and voting structures are, are very, still very top down in nature where like we think outcome coalitions can move things is bottoms up where funding is just flowing to projects that have people actively contributing and working towards them, right? And that's like a really cool idea is that we no longer have to get consensus on specific ideas, rather we achieve consensus by what people are actually working on and have the funding flow there automatically. Right, and what was the part about builder staking? Yes, so a lot of times people say they're gonna build something in DAOs but never get around to doing it. <laughs> yeah. And this is kind of a way to ensure. <laughs> like I believe builders have the best intentions, I really do, like I'm a builder, we're all builders, Everybody has the best of intentions. And I use builders generically. Like I don't mean builders in terms of like coders or developers. I just mean like for, for any initiative to get done, someone has to be willing to fund it and someone has to be willing to do it. So essentially the reason why we like have builders stake on getting it done is like one, it's their way of expressing that they're going to opt into doing this thing. And it kind of holds them accountable a bit, right? In the pseudo-anonymous world where we don't have unique proof of personhood right now, you can kind of proxy that with the idea of staking. So builders stake on accomplishing a bounty, essentially. And if they accomplish those milestones, not only do they get the funding that people used, but they get their stake back as well. Right. The way like a lot of modern organizations get around this idea of staking is the idea of elections, right? We elect someone for four years, and then this person is essentially for four years staking their reputation on accomplishing different goals, right? That's like a kind of a proxy of what elections provide. We can like have a li little bit more liquid elections by essentially allowing people to say, hey, I'm gonna be a leader or builder for this one initiative and you don't have to elect me, I'm just willing to stake my personal whatever 
on it to show that I am going to get the thing done. Yeah, yeah, I love it. I hope we will have something similar soon in the questing system, at least for the the most important stuff. Everybody keeps on talking about is reputation systems and feel like there's five projects building some reputation system thing. And in metagame people were suggesting that we should do that too. But like, besides the fact that there's a possibility that it turns dystopian, it doesn't really solve a problem. Like a reputation is not a guarantee. And especially with like anon accounts, like just because somebody built up a reputation doesn't mean that they won't uh, fuck up now. They can just create a new account. You say you're gonna do something, just stake. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's like definitely not a guarantee. Reputation has like a time, like time decay function on it, especially in the crypto space. Like we forget things so fast. You know, like six months is like six years here. And so like if someone did something six months ago, we already kind of forgot about it. And I also just think reputation makes sense when we reach an insane amount of people and we're just like not there yet. Um, and like you say, it doesn't work for a non accounts. This is like a big theory I have. Like if something doesn't work for an anon account, that means we're always to a bit trusting a benevolent dictatorship. You know what I mean? Because it means that we have to trust the person to some degree. Right. So, But yeah, this whole issue of discussing things and then things not happening, what happened a lot in our case is just uh, making sure that there's always somebody assigned to it. So whatever ongoing initiative that you have, there is always... Uh, somebody assigned as a champion of it and then that person makes sure that the the ball keeps on rolling and they don't have to do the work themselves even they could just uh, make sure to always divide it up into quests and the quests are pushed out to the rest of metagame but it's their responsibility that the thing moves forward so we don't have the whole uh, somebody anybody everybody issue I actually 100% agree with this idea of having a champion or a maintainer. It's like actually a role we've been thinking about introducing into the Outcome Coalition like Sundown. And something that I would like to see done in the future that we're working on is there's like a lot of really interesting mechanisms where you can reward like champions for championing better ideas. You know what I mean? Like you can be a good champion, not just like in the fact that you move things along in a good way, but that you're picking good things to champion. You know what I mean? I also think one of the things that we're trying to discover is that when you expand the idea of governance past voting, like if we consider discussions and having a dissenting opinion a part of governance and you reward people for discussion and having a dissenting opinion, we think it'll happen more often. You know what I mean? Like right now you don't get rewarded if you have it. In fact, you usually get like mocked if you have a dissenting opinion. So what if we could reward like good opinions um in that are both pros and cons right yeah there's also this general problem of people not being so willing to give feedback you know in these communities everybody wants to be friends everybody wants to continue being friends nobody wants to be an asshole and so sometimes things uh, go unsaid and sometimes they're important things where maybe it would have been better to just say i'm sorry but this uh Shit job that you did. <laughs> this is a shitty piece of work you did. But if there was a reward for it, maybe. <laughs> maybe people will do it better. No, I, I think something that I'm coming around to is that... More people would rise up to the occasion to be assholes. Yeah, more people will rise up if we pay people for giving mean opinions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a bad idea. Yeah, that's the, that's the hard thing. I, I've, I've kind of come around... I'm coming around to the... I, I used to believe that we could run things and so mechanistically and build like perfect societies based off mechanisms. But I've now look, I'm kind of in making amending that recently, which is that like, maybe you can build really equitable systems mechanistically, but if you build like shitty and bad human processes in a bad culture, may, no one's going to want to live in your perfect utopia. You know what I mean? Like perfect yeah. utopia is like only exist to people. So like, yeah, you could have the most equitable system ever, but if people are really mean to each other when they give dissenting opinions, <laughs> yeah. you know what? No one's going to want to live in that utopia, right? If people are like, you know, you're a piece of, you know, your work was shitty and I hate you and your parents <laughs> suck. <laughs> like, yeah, you could have the most equitable system of governance ever, but no one's going to want to live there. No one's going to want to participate. <laughs> yeah, nobody's going to take a risk on anything. Exactly, exactly. So I'm like, learning you need both. 
and again, I actually think one of the things metagame does kind of well, one of the things that I've like learned at Raid Guild and a couple of the other DAOs I'm in is the idea of creating stories to create like community norms or community culture, right? I think there's like a lot of societies and communities we see that like come up with stories that teach them like ways to interact with each other. And so that's like something I'm trying to spend more time doing. Yeah, agree. Are you in the actual Raid Guild uh, lore writing? Uh, I'm not involved in the lore writing of Raid Guild itself, but I am in Raid Guild. But I, I, I do like the lore writing people that are doing it. Yeah, important work. And to be clear, I actually think one of the... I actually have like become the biggest believer in open source, and I'm specifically becoming like very obsessed with the language Git. All this off-chain human processing stuff, I actually don't think it's a problem. I actually think it's... Because I used to think that anything that was dependent on humans, there isn't enough accountability on the person... You are too tied to this person and like you aren't like there's no freedom to exit. There's no freedom to fork any of these pieces. And so I actually now just think like any of the lore you write, any of these cultural norms or processes that you create, it's actually not a problem as long as your organization is forkable. Like as long as you can fork it and start your own and you can rage quit your like physical sweat equity contributions, then I think it's like actually equitable, right? Because now we've put a check and balance on the leaders, right? It's all about putting a check and balance on the people that are creating the lore, right? And so like, if we are have this organization and we're creating lore and stories around it, that is not a problem as long as you're able to one, fork the lore, fork the processes, and you're able to rage quit your like contributions and make them apply to a new organization. Like that I think is really, really important. And as long as you're able to do that, I actually have less of a problem with it. And I can give like an example of like where this fails if, if that helps clue this, this kind of point out. Right. I think like the whole idea of uh, dictatorship is less scary when you can just be like, oh, fuck this guy. I'm going to just take this stuff and put it elsewhere. I'm going to fork. It, right. Exactly. Exactly. I think in general, this is like kind of a weird analogy. Another like example of something that does a really go a good job of using like lore and stories to create cultural norms is religion right like religion created this book and it, like influenced a lot of cultural norms but like the issue is i think one of the reasons people like don't just fork their religion or their like the the whatever text they they pray to or use is because like you can't rage quit your prayers you know what i mean like you can't rage quit and fork the prayers you've made you know some odd years of old and you're like wow you know this version is like not really working for me i wish i could really fork it and you know create my own version Like you can't like rage quit your prayers you've made to one person and, and make or you know one quote unquote god and, and, and apply it to another god. And I think that's like a problem. That's when we have like a dictatorship, right? And it's the same thing when we talk about like dictatorships in like countries, like you're saying, right? Like the issue why it's so much easier to overthrow a dictator than fork it is because you can't fork all the contributions you made to your country or your nation state, whatever. And so if we made it just as easy to rage quit and fork like everything you've done for a civic society, I think, like you said, dictators would be a less of a problem. Right. All the dictators would be benevolent dictators held accountable by the ability to fork. They would all be benevolent dictators or not even a benevolent because benevolent assumes that they're being good, right? They're accountable dictators. <laughs> That's what they are. They're dictators, but they're accountable, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I like that term. I'm going to start using that. I don't want benevolent dictators. I want accountable dictators. <laughs> yeah. I mean, maybe the community expects them to do evil. Maybe that's what the community is about. Yeah, that's true. That's the hard thing, man. That's the hard thing that we get into is like, what happens when these like things get used for bad purposes, right? Right. Yeah, like uh, organ harvesters, ZK DAO. That doesn't sound good. Oof. Oof. I, that does not sound fun, man. I like, I don't know. I, I just believe, I like believe there are more good people than bad people out there. You know, technology is value agnostic. And we just got to like get this and get the technology in as many hands as, as many people that want like equitability in society. And, and hopefully the, you know, hopefully if we can get this, it's, I, whenever I feel bad about the world, I just go play. If you ever, have you ever played the Evolution of Trust, this like web game uh, by Casey, I forget his last name, Casey something. Ah, it's a part of the kernel curriculum as well, right? Oh, it might be part of the kernel learning. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's part of the kernel learning. 
But it, it's basically this game that simulates, you know it. Yeah, I know it. I mean, if it is the one, but uh, go on. Yeah, it basically, it's a game that like simulates out a bunch of different options when you play the Prisoner's Dilemma, right? Do you cheat each other? It like simulates a bunch of these strategies. And it like mathematically shows that if more people cooperate with one another more often, like that, they will win out. Like they will beat out the cheaters. As long as enough people are willing to cooperate together instead of defecting, like you will beat out bad actors as long as enough people are willing to cooperate. And I believe enough people are willing to cooperate if they can get some trust with one another. And so like that's my saving grace against like how this technology can be used for bad. Is that like we don't have to we just have to, we don't have to worry about there's going to be bad people in this world that shouldn't be our goal is to eliminate bad people our goal should just be to get this in enough hands of enough people that want to cooperate rather than defect and we'll be able to create and i mean good and bad in a weird way i don't mean value judgments good and bad i mean good in terms of they want more people to have more power versus bad being they want less people to have more power if as long as we can get the technology in the hand of people that want to cooperate with one another Like, we will always be able to keep power with the people where it should lie, wherever that is. Right. But ZK DAOs still scare me. <laughs> they still scare me, too. They they really scare me. But there's a lot of good happening as well, and hopefully the good will outweigh the bad. How do you think we, like, combat the bad? Like, what do you think? I don't know. Depends on whose definition of uh, bad you mean. Is it yours or the organ harvesters? <laughs> But yeah, just like... Uh, Have you had a lot of dealings with organ harvesters, Pete? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I just uh, seem to have this weird obsession with them. <laughs> <laughs> That's <weird. laughs> no, I was just trying to uh, think of a worst possible use case for the ZK DAOs. But yeah, basically any sort of a criminal organization like that. I don't know if we can directly change that, but as long as we can create enough DAOs that empower people, make it as easy as possible to create DAOs and to coordinate, then the people who are in these specific locations where they could uh, fight these kinds of threats, hopefully it will help them. There is power in just being able to organize, right? The freedom of assembly, the freedom to organize is like, I think one of the most powerful tools we have against like bad actors that amass power, right? Right. But what was the, the thing that you said or how you said it in the Dow Stewart School talked about uh, bribery? Oh, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> this, <laughs> this is one of my my uh, my weird takes. Like, I don't have a problem with bribery. Um, I think the issue with bribery is when it's undercover bribery or, like, it is hidden bribery or unchecked bribery. Like, bribery is a problem when no one knows about it except for you and the person you're bribing. Right. But if it is open and is transparent and everybody sees that you are getting paid, like if the incentives are clear and as long as like money isn't the final power of voting, then I like obviously I have a problem with it. Right. It causes a lot of damage and bad. But to me, it's just another form of incentives. And the issue is, is that we have unequal access to bribery. Right. Some people have a tremendously large amount of money and they can bribe politicians or bribe anybody to do a certain thing. But no one else can match that kind of power, right? And so we need to check some balance against it. But like, let's be clear, if everybody had equal access to bribery and like, like that's what taxes are. Taxes are legal, like force bribery to do certain things. <laughs> right. Crowdfunded bribery. Right. It's crowdfunded bribery for things that we've all agreed are important, right? That's what taxes are. But if like we were able to like better influence, bribery goes by another name, which is just marketplace for governance. And if we were better able to influence different initiatives by providing incentive for those initiatives, like that would be good if it worked for more people. Bribery is bad when it only works for, like, when I pay P a million dollars to do one thing that only benefits me and he lies to the rest of his community. And no one knows that I bribed, right? That's when it's really, really bad. But like when it's open, when it's transparent, and when everybody has equal access to the same tool, that's when it's really good. 
it just like unequal access is bad, right? Yeah, like it's the exact same thing like with the the online influencers, like they promote a project in a shitty way, or do they say, "Hey, I was paid to shield this product"? Because when they say, "I was paid to shield this NFT," then it's like, okay, fine, like you can promote it all you want, just uh, don't act to be intrinsically motivated. Right, exactly. Like you want to understand the incentives and why people think certain things. Um, like most of our like societies operate on some type of like open bribery aspect, right? Like bribery, like is just like paying someone for like something to happen, and that is like how our kind of world goes round. It's just a problem when that's enclosed, like when it's lied about and it's not out in the open. Um, but it, exactly, it's the same thing as like influencer versus creator, right? You know what I mean? Like they're the same. It just you know. Yeah, we just have such a knee-jerk reaction to bribery because it's been used so poorly. And we and the issue is is that we have so much unequal access to capital in this world. We do not correctly value human physical contributions. We don't correctly value humans and what it means like the value you bring by just existing in relation to the amount of wealth that one person can um, can amass. And that's really the problem is that like. Not only do we have unequal access to the tool, we have unequal access on how to use the tool, right? It's like, okay, you can give two people both access to a power drill, fine, now equal access to the tool. But if one person has the ability to use the power drill for like literally millennial, but I can only use the power drill for one second, it's like, well, that's kind of a problem. Like there is network effects in existing. Like bribery is a problem because we don't correctly value the ability or idea of existing. And like when we both you allow people to amass wealth and then we use wealth as a proxy for, for importance, we have a problem now. I really like think we would all be more okay with bribery if like we had more equal access to it and like there wasn't such great disparities in wealth, but there is and that's a problem. So we want to get rid of the tool until we can fix the core problems is the issue. Yeah, it's funny how much the context actually matters. You would think that this is just a permanently bad thing, but if you make it transparent and available to anyone, then it's not a bad thing. I think the similar way with taxes, you could just say, oh, taxes are theft. But if it was transparent, and we were able to see where the money goes and we were able to influence how the money is spent, I actually wouldn't mind paying taxes because I do want there to be street light or there not to be potholes and things like that. But uh, I hate the corruption in the system. <laughs> exactly exactly right like the issue is is that we like give our taxes and then it's that's because we are giving money but we're having no say on how it's done and other people are quote unquote maybe bribing the people that are collecting our taxes to do stuff that is not good for us right that's when bribery is bad it's so ironic to me because in the crypto world we pay so many taxes to each other all the time like all the time like gas fees are a form of a tax like Within DAOs, whenever we, there is it's just we know exactly where the taxes is going. When we operate in a DAO and we govern, we pay taxes to the people that are governing all the time. We just have more say over it. We're okay with it. There's this thing I'm trying to meme into existence, where a lot of people don't like big government, but they like coordination. All government is is coordination. So I'm trying to reframe the reframe the phrase. Big government, like I'm not into big government, but I'm into big coordination, right? Because um, I think if we just thought about big government as big coordination, we would all be more in favor of it. Right. It's a dirty word. Dirty word, exactly, exactly. But if we're in the DAO space, like you're, we're bureaucrats here. Like let's, like let's not mince meat here. Like we lead organizations, we try to make things happen. Like we are the big government and the big coordination that people talk about. We just are doing it in an open and equitable way where people have more accountability over us. It's interesting. I think the types of taxes we introduce into the Ethereum space is going to be really fascinating to me. Seems to be going well. Seems to be going well. It's early, early days, but yeah, it seems to be going really well so far. So, or as good as one could anticipate, um, which is, you know, what I'm happy about. Do, do you think DAO should charge more taxes to DAO members? Like, do you think that should be a thing? Yeah, I think there should be something. Like, in our case, I want there to be uh, some kind of membership fees for the people who don't want to actively contribute. Like, you want to be a part of the project, you want to be 
a part of this whole movement. I love this idea, but plan on actively contributing. Why not subscribe to paying like 10 bucks a month or something? Yep. No, I, I agree. I think that's like, I was actually just talking to someone else about that. It'd be like so interesting if when you're in a Moloch DAO, every year you had to pay like re-pledge or pay a new tax of some type, like a new like monthly yearly fee, right? Or you contribute, right? You either contribute with like sweat equity, you like lead initiatives and meetings, or you just pay a fee. Yeah. We have two types of contributors in MetaGame. So we have players and patrons. The players have to be actively contributing to MetaGame and the patrons are allowed to be inactive, but they have to buy the tokens that the, the players produce. And then since we are limited to the numbers number, then every few months we do a purge where we get rid of all the inactive players to make space for the new ones. And I just heard about another organization doing something similar, you know, in Spiral, with, uh, Richard Bartlett. You know, I know you know the guy, so you probably know the project as well. But basically, the way that they do it is uh, every six months, everyone is considered not a member. And then yeah, every, every six months, everyone has to apply again to uh, become a member of the organization. That's fascinating. I really like that. How, is that. how does that work when you all do the purge for the players? I'm not a member, but it seems to be going well for them. And the way we did it worked for us, but this seems to be a better model. Around that same kind of idea, there's like this interesting thing that when the U.S. Constitution, so when one of the quote-unquote founding fathers of the U.S. was this guy named Thomas Jefferson, and he believed, one of the things he believed in a letter he wrote to James Madison was that the U.S. Constitution should be rewritten every 19 years. That like every 19 years, and, and the line was that like the Constitution reflect the life of the living, right? And so every 19 years, you should have to rewrite it, which I think is like a fascinating idea. Not just that like you have to purge the players, but you have to purge the game that's being played too. Hmm, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, we have this uh, meta manifesto, and I always thought that it should uh, be uh, ever evolving, like to. The current, the first version that I wrote, I always thought of as a V1, but I never thought of like uh, actually rewriting the whole thing. Mm. It would probably change drastically if we do update versus verse rewrite, right? Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, it also depends on how you do it. Like the first time we did it, we did uh, this big session where we were, where we were mapping like our hierarchical values and then figuring out which are the most commonly held one or like held in highest regard. But it also depends even more on uh, how much the culture changes and with uh, new people coming in. Yeah, I was about to say that same thing, which is kind of fascinating. And it actually is reflecting this idea that I've been thinking a lot about recently, which is I think a lot of people define themselves by the organization they're a part of, but that's not it. Like the organization doesn't define you you define the organization, especially at the beginning of something. An organization is defined by the people that make it up. But once it grows to a certain size, all of a sudden the organization starts to define the people. But that's like never the truth. That's never the right way to look at it, right? We should always have bottoms up definitions. And if you force yourself to rewrite something, I actually think it allows the organization to shift based off the culture. Like you said, if it's the same people playing, it's the same culture, you're going to rewrite something very similar. But if the culture has changed, now you allow the organization to actually update their culture to what the people actually want it to be. Um, and I think it's like a very powerful way of allowing organizations to, to be a lot more uh, fluid in the way that they grow. Right. And it perfectly loops back into where we started, which is the idea of people being able to govern the things that govern us. Exactly. Yes, Pete. Way to bring it back together. Yes, I love that. Seems like a perfect point to end it on. I love a good, I love a good uh, ending where you started. It's always the best way to do it. <laughs> well, this was great. Do you have anything else you want to add? Some closing thoughts? Yeah, closing thoughts. This was a super interesting conversation. I'm like definitely gonna. There's like a bunch of things I want to go work on now. But if anyone has any like thoughts or ideas on this, like 
jump into the Govern Discord. Like we're trying to build more modules and like updated frameworks and learn how best to like measure physical sweat equity contributions. So come join. Awesome. If you're listening to this, there should by now be a link to that in the show notes. Oh, one more thing that I try to ask every guest, which is that if you had one advice to give to Metagame, what would it be? God damn it. <laughs> well, now I want to tell you to rewrite the manifesto. <laughs> we need to find a new champion for that because I'm not doing it. <laughs> it was the hardest thing that I wrote up to that point. <laughs> um, no, I, it's, uh, I would say one advice is just like recognize the contributions people are making, right? Make it easy for them to own their own contributions and, you know, trust the process of letting yourself be accountable. So, Well said. Well said. And sounds like it applies to a lot of DAOs out there. So if you're listening, you heard. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. This was great. Thanks for having me. It was super fun. Welcome. See you around, man. See ya.